Well, 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 good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is the time of the afternoon. As I had mentioned earlier on, we are about to start our interview. Now, local government elections are just around the corner, and I am sure that it is as important to you as it is important to me to know my candidate before I go and cast my vote. So today I'm excited to be having the privilege to interview one such candidate. I am going to be talking to the DA Democratic Alliance mayoral candidate for the Johannesburg city, the city of Johannesburg, Dr. Mpo Palatse, who is joining me right now for this conversation. Tell others, tag them. Um, the program is called Tell the World with me, Zanele Mboganzi. Dr. Mpo, good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining me. Afternoon. I cannot believe I'm being interviewed by the legendary Zanella Mokadi. I mean, we all grew up watching you. Yeah, it's so surreal. But yes, thanks for having me. I am so glad that you could come. I am so glad that you are here. I know you must be exhausted. You are on the campaign um, trail and, um, you know, we, you, you literally, literally just arrived. Um, what were you doing today? I had such a packed day, but very exciting. We started out in Hillbrow where we visited this rec center where homeless people are staying since the lockdown, since lockdown level mm -hmm. five, the government brought them into that facility to try and curb the spread of the virus. But what then happened is that they ended up living there and now they're feeling neglected by the city of Johannesburg, particularly the homelessness unit. We have contacted the city to hear their side of the story. So I'll be following up on that. Um, from there, we went to Jubet Park, um, the Substance Abuse Treatment Center, one of the five that we championed, that we opened when I was MMC for Health in the city. So I had received complaints that it's no longer operational. So we just went to see what's going on. When we got there, it was open, but there were conflicting reports of what's happening. Some people, even community members still saying no, but it's been closed. The staff insisting it's been open, so we're not sure what happened there. But it is sure. open now, and I just wanted to make sure that people are being serviced. Jubet Park is important because a lot of people living on the street congregate around the park throughout the day, and a lot of them have a problem of substance abuse. So we particularly established that center for them, and we want to know that they're continuing to enjoy that service. And then we did a walkabout of the transport hub, you know, we were next to MTN Rank. I don't know if it's still called MTN Rank. I think at some point the name was going to change. But yes, so we did a walkabout in that precinct just to chat to residents and people in the informal trade and hear what their issues are and what they'd like us to do for them when we take over after these elections. And it was quite interesting. I mean, one thing that really shocked me and, and really saddened me was that it turns out that when the nc took over the city they closed down all the ablution facilities in that area so people are using buckets in full view of everyone and you have to pay a, a two rand to which place is this this which is place is this taxi rank so Nuard, it used to be called Nuard. you know that whole yeah. area there's buckets you'll see these buckets along the wall on either sides of the road and those buckets are full of number ones. Um, I didn't see any number twos, but apparently people also do number twos. And you pay. So whenever you get close to a bucket, the owner will emerge. And then you give them a two rand. And right there in full view of everyone, you help yourself. Sure. So anyway, we, yeah. we, we're going to get down to that as to what exactly are you going to do about all those things. But first things first, you know, you are Dr. Mpo. Palazzi. Is this an honorary doctorate? Is this, are you a doctor of education or are you a medical doctor? So now I'm actually a medical doctor, believe it or not. Um, I Medusa, yes, I studied at Medunsa. I qualified in 2005 as a medical doctor from Medunsa. And then I then worked for about six years before moving to Joburg to do to specialize in public health medicine. And that's when I ended up in Johannesburg and I've never left. Now, for a medical doctor, surely something must have happened that became either a push factor or a pull factor. Um, when was this turnaround and why did you leave the medical profession into politics? 
You know, Zanele, um, one of the things I ended up doing as a doctor was I ended up working for my own company. I had contracts with Sasa in, in Gauteng and in the Northwest. I was doing disability assessments for them. So anybody who wanted to apply for a disability grant would come and I would assess whether or not they qualified. And it was in Khanyesa. Khanyesa is in the Northwest province, quite close to the Northern Cape. It's a very poor area, very underdeveloped, and people didn't have jobs. And I was having queues and queues of people with their hospital files coming to ask for disability grants because they've got uncontrolled diabetes or they've had three cesarean sections. I mean, the stories just got more and more bizarre until I realized actually the problem here is poverty and unemployment and that mm. people just want to put food on the table. And I felt so ill-equipped to ass assist them as a doctor in my position, as a, as a disability consultant in that position. I started asking them questions, you know, how is it that you guys don't have jobs? And they said to us, there's nothing here. There's no factories, there's no farms, there's nothing. You know, so if you're not a policeman, a nurse, a teacher, uh, a social worker, or a cashier at the shop right supermarket, then chances are you're unemployed. And I realized that there's more that needs to happen. Um, I also began to see how interconnected different sectors of government are so I was confined to the health sector as a health mm -hmm. professional, but I realized that a lot of the people I was seeing needed jobs. They needed money for transport. They needed money for food. And the fact that they didn't have that was translating into health issues. So for instance, mm -hmm. you have this diabetic, the diabetic patient that's not working. They, they can't eat healthy, so they're bound to have uncontrolled diabetes. Chances are they don't have transport money to come to their appointments, so they're bound to miss their appointments. Chances are they're on insulin, they can't even store it properly because chances are they don't have electricity or they don't have access to a fridge. And so, you know, that's also bound to affect their outcomes. Um, if somebody has TB, for instance, we know that overcrowding contributes towards the spread of infectious diseases like tuberculosis, how people live, you know, very densely populated settlements actually worsen conditions like those. Um, things like access to clean water and sanitation. A lot of diarrheal illnesses are as a direct result of lack of access to clean water and proper sanitation. So I began to realize that actually I'm limited, you know, in what I'm trying to do. Mm. I'm trying to help people, but all I'm doing is giving them medicine and sending them back to the same living conditions that led to the sickness in the first place. And I don't like to fail. I'm a person who likes to push myself. I like to solve problems. So I wasn't gonna stay in that place where I couldn't solve their problems. So I decided then that I want to specialize and in a specialty that would help me solve their problems. So I did public health medicine. Why? Because public health medicine focuses on administrative health. Your patient is the population as opposed mm -hmm. to an individual. So I did that and um, uh, that's when I came to VITS. I actually applied broadly and I, um, I, I first got the call from VITS, did my interview, I got accepted and I started in 2011, January 2011. So this year, January was exactly 10 years that I've mm. been in Joburg. Um, so when I finished the four years, I then went and worked in Alexandra as a casual, casualty officer. And while I was there, um, in my first week of doing casualty calls, I realized there's so much violence in this township people are stabbing each other for useless things i mean you get involved in an accident you know accidents happen alex roads are small if you if you're involved in an accident with a taxi driver you dare not ask them to go to the police station because chances are they will stab you you know um, a child would come having been assaulted by another child at school for doing nothing so i was seeing all this violence and i began to wonder what's causing it driving through alex if you look at the living conditions of people in alexandra you'll begin to understand why people are so angry why there's this brewing anger and aggression and violence that's leading people to living how they're living and that made me very angry but the last straw was this one sunday morning i'd been on call that saturday night 5 a.m. on Sunday, five young men wheeled in, each one with multiple gunshot wounds. Two died in our hands. We transferred three to Charlotte McLeake. Two died there, so only one survived. I cried Zanele for the whole week. I could not stop crying. It was all too much. I had secondary trauma from all the trauma that I was exposed mm -hmm. to. 
And I felt I could not carry on like that. So I knew then that I had two options. I was either going to turn and walk away as if I'd never seen what I had seen, or if I was going to stay, I had to be a part of the solution. So I started contacting people. One of the people I contacted was a friend. We specialized together at WITS, uh, Dr. Heinrich Balmink. He was then the Deputy Shadow Minister of Health in the Democratic Alliance. And I wrote to him and I said, Heinrich, why is government allowing people to live like this? You know, what is wrong? And he gave me a call and he said to me, Paul, why don't you get involved? Now, remember at this time, I had just come out of the VITS circuit. Um, I had put my business on hold for the four years that I was studying. I was about to reestablish my business. I had applied for office space at Marble Towers in the CBD. I was going to do disability medicine. I had done my road accident fund diploma while at VITS. But at so this particular started. stage, at this particular stage, politics, had it crossed your mind at all? No, not at all. Um, I mean, my plans were, I'm going back to business. You know, my business had been closed down for the time I was studying. So I was looking forward to reestablishing my business. And, and when he said this, I said to him, but I've got all these plans. And he said to me, no, but you can apply to be a PR counselor. So a PR counselor, unlike a ward counselor, is an opposition counselor in a ward that your party did not win. Mm. So he said to me, apply to be a PR counselor. Um, and hopefully you can work in Alex and you can get involved in your spare time or, you know, as a, as a peer counselor, you can have another job. It's allowed. And so the idea was I'll still continue with my plans and I'll be a peer counselor in Alex and I'll help the people of Alexandra by driving. The Maybe industry. why Alex, if I may ask, was it because of what you were witnessing in terms of the violence and the aggression that you have been talking about? Is that the reason yeah. why you specifically chose that particular area? Yeah, I was working in Alexandra. So when I came uh, out of okay. the circuit, before I could establish my business, I looked for a job just so that I had something going in the meantime. So I had a few jobs. I mean, I was on the Health Professions Council Professional Conduct Committee. I did medical legal work in Ekurileni as well at the same time. And, and the Alex work was an add-on to that. So yes, it's because of what I was exposed to in Alexandra. And I realized, I mean... I didn't grow up in Alex, but I realized that sometimes when you've lived in a place for so long, you get desensitized to the wrong mm. that's happening in that place. And I felt like the people of Alex needed somebody from outside, somebody mm. who could be angry enough to drive their issues, somebody who could say, but people aren't supposed to live like this. And I know that they know it, but they know it, but they've accepted it, you know, yeah. and it's kind of become their normal. So you, you then applied? Did it happen? Did you become a, a PR counselor? I then applied. I remember I applied to be a counselor before I applied to be a member of the party. So in the Democratic Alliance, you apply online. So I started my online application, uploaded my CV, did all of that. And then I got to the question, are you a member of the DA? And I realized, oops, I need to be a member of the party in order to serve in the party. So that's how politically naive I was. So I then went back and I did my membership, which I could also do online. And then I came and I, I concluded my application to be a counselor. I became a counselor. Of course, we had to campaign. I campaigned in Alexandra. So I did door to door in Alex, got to engage with the people of Alex. I was so sure I wanted to serve Alexandra. I then, yes, um, we elections happened. I was on the list and I was electable and I became a counselor. What I didn't know, though, was that when the then mayor had to choose his team of 10 MMCs, I was, you know, the, the best qualified person. Given my experience and my background, he really felt I was the right person to help lead the health and social development portfolio. And so I was appointed an MMC for health and social development. And Zanella, I remember after the announcement, because I wasn't even warned, you know, the DA is very careful about things leaking before the time so nobody knew who's an mmc and who's not the press so you became sorry i just want to i just want to get this clear you became an mmc under the da ticket definitely yes okay. so immediately after beca becoming a counselor i became an mmc under the da ticket and for so how long was this um so this lasted for three years um, the reason why I'd lost it for three years is because at the end of 2019, the then mayor resigned. Um, he resigned because of differences of, 
opinion on how to approach development between himself and the Democratic Alliance. Um, the Democratic Alliance felt that the mayor had um, given in too much to the demands of the EFF and our developmental approach is completely different. The EFF believes that they serve only a certain constituency, only the poor, and they believe to serve the poor, they must neglect everyone else. We believe in a different types of economics. We believe okay. that I'm going to come to that because yeah. earlier on, I did ask people on Facebook to give me questions that they would like me to ask you. So one of those questions is what you are alluding to right now. But I just want to come back. So you and MMC in Johannesburg, the city of Johannesburg, um, for about three years. Surely there must have been some accomplishments because people will say, why should we trust you now? And um, give me about two or three things that you're very proud of that you delivered when you were in that position. You know, Zanele, before I even thought of entering politics, I had started working on substance abuse as a, as a challenge, um, yeah. particularly amongst our youth. Um, yeah. As a person who's always been passionate about young people, I mean, I used to lead a church youth group when I was in varsity, so I really love young people, and I believe young people are the future, and we need to invest in young people. I was concerned, and I saw substance abuse as a cancer, because it was becoming almost fashionable to smoke drugs, you know, and people were starting to do it socially, and they were starting to do it openly, and it really worried me. So I started working with two gentlemen before I even joined politics, and we were going to register an NGO with a focus on substance abuse. So I had done a lot of research. Uh, I had a concept document that I had put together on how to turn things around. And when mm -hmm. the opportunity came for me to be an MMC, and we started the IDP process, the integrated development planning process, where we go into communities and we engage with them on issues that trouble them, one of the things that kept coming up was substance abuse. And I thought to myself, Paul, you've done all this conceptual work around the topic why not take that and bring it into your work in the city and so i brought officials around the table we even had external stakeholders who funded some more studies and we did some study tours as well to finalize the concept of what it is that we want to do in the city of Joburg. and mm. we rolled out before i left in 2019 we had rolled out five outpatient treatment centers for substance abuse community-based within walking distance from people who need the service completely free of charge. And outpatient service also means that there's no bed capacity issues. So with inpatient rehab, you'll know that they'll often say it's full, you know, and then you have to wait for someone to get discharged before you can go in. So that's one of the things I'm really proud of, the service. That's why I said to you earlier that I went to Jubet Park today to see if this center is still open. It's one of the five that we opened. We started in Soweto, in Gladi. We went to Eldorado Park, then Jubet Park, then Alexandra than Westbury. We, of course, started with areas that had the biggest burden of substance abuse. The other thing that we did under my, my leadership was extending hours of service in our clinics. And this, again, I, I'm, I'm really proud of because as a doctor, I saw how people often had to choose between coming to the clinic and going to work. Um, even when they were feeling sick or when it was their mm. date to come for their chronic meds. And this is because of the scarcity of jobs and people being scared to lose their jobs. And, and so over and over, we would see people coming in emergency hypertension or in diabetic coma or in, you know, emergence in, in an asthma attack. Why? Because this person would have run out of their treatment and they would have missed their appointment because they didn't want to lose their job. And mm. so I was really excited when the then mayor said to me, on the campaign trail, he also picked up the same need. And we then decided, let's extend hours of service in, in all our clinics. Um, of course, there were budgetary constraints. So we started with the first one in Princess, in Rodeport, and we kept adding and adding and adding. And by the end of the three years, we had extended in hours of service in 27 clinics, different permutations, some open weekends on public holidays and later in the day up to 10 o'clock for some of the clinics. That's the second one. The, the last one that I'd like to mention is the mobile clinics. Um, this was um, a, a, in answer to a motion that was tabled by the EFF. When they brought it, we actually supported it because we saw the need and the importance, uh, particularly with informal settlements uh, being so far away from brick and mortar clinics and not being able to access health care according to the law. You must have a clinic within five, a five-kilometer radius of where you live. 
And with informal settlements, we often struggled constructing brick and mortar clinics because of um, a whole lot of complications around the township not being proclaimed yet. So you struggle with finding land and so on. And so we agreed on a temporary solution. In fact, when the EFF brought the motion, we, we were like, this is great. We're going to support it as the Democratic Alliance. And I then got to champion it. And we rolled out 10 uh, mobile clinics, which today okay. will go around the city giving services. Okay. Well, I'm glad that you've got things that you believe you can point out and say, this is my legacy. So to say, these are the things that I've done. Now, we don't have to, um, I mean, the city of Joburg, the city of Joburg is, is, is an internationally renowned metropolis um, contributing so much to the GDP of the country, but also with, with a huge population. I believe that you've got more than 4 million people living in the city. And I mean, this is big. This is big. And you want to be the mayor of Johannesburg. It's got its own challenges at present. And I believe that the people on the ground are just tired of promises and promises and promises. I mean, you still have issues with with drugs, as you've mentioned, with trafficking, potholes, um, electricity issues, homes. I mean, this election is about bread and butter issues. It's, it's very close to people's hearts because it's about how you live and how the municipality can be of service to you. Now, what are your big plans for, for, for Johannesburg, for this city? Or maybe let me rephrase, what will be your priorities? If people were to give you an opportunity to lead the city, what, what will be your immediate priorities when you take office? You know, Zanella, when I started on the campaign trail, so this is my fifth week now, and I've been crisscrossing the city, engaging broadly, you know, at all levels, with residents, with business, civil society organizations, residents associations, taxi associations. So we've really mm -hmm. been um, engaging broadly to find out what exactly is it that people need from the government that will take over after the 1st of November. And I was shocked to find what I found. People are asking for basics. They're asking for a sense of normality. The city is broken. Uh, people don't have access to clean running water all the time. They don't have access to an, an, an uninterrupted supply of electricity. In some parts of the city, people have been without electricity for up to three years. You know, so people are fed up and it's almost as if they're not even able to dream beyond the dream for normality and functionality. Mm -hmm. And so people are asking us, please just get the city to work again. You know, just get, give us basics, water, electricity, proper sanitation, roads that are surfaced, a safe city, give us jobs. These are things that people are asking for. And when we engage the business sector, we thought they will get a different answer. And you'd be surprised, even they're asking for the same thing because when the city is not working and it's not delivering basic services, businesses cannot operate. I mean, I've, I've spoken to business people who are spending tens of thousands of rands on diesel for generators to keep the doors of their businesses open. It's, it's expensive, it's not sustainable. All they too want is a sense of normality so that they can function. And we, mm. we've seen a crumbling of the economy. COVID has had a lot to do with that. But if we can't even just provide basic services, then how do we hope for the economy to recover? So it does look like that then becomes the number one priority you know, getting the city to function, going back to basics, getting the basics in place, water, electricity, roads, sewer, um, transport, safety. Those are the things that people are asking for and that's what we're going to prioritize. Good. You know, earlier on, before we, we, we came live, I asked people on Facebook, especially, what is it that they would like me to ask you? Two critical things that came out. One is directed to you, the other one is to the DA in general. But the first one was Lebo um, uh, Mufukeng. I actually read. He says, our CZ, please ask, why, why, why? Didn't you see what the Democratic Alliance did to Hemen Mashaba, Musi Maibane, and Bali? Please tell her it is going to end in tears. Why the DA? Why did you decide to work with the DA 
Um, I've seen a lot of candidates that are going solo as independents. Why are you choosing to be part of the Democratic Alliance or to be a candidate of the DA? Well, I've been in the DA now um, for six years, Zanele. And in the six years I've been in the DA, I've been very happy. Um, there's no other place I'd rather be. In fact, you know, just looking at the culture of some of the other political parties, I could never function in that type of environment. I can't function in chaos. You know, I can't function in noise. I need a very professional environment to function. I am a professional, you know, I didn't just wake up one day and decide I want to do politics. I want to do administration. I want to run the city. I studied for it. And, and I want a sense of professionalism in my workspace. For me, that was a big pull. So the whole culture and ethos of the Democratic Alliance. But also, if you look at their values and principles, I mean, the DEA believes in freedom, fairness, opportunity, equal opportunity, but opportunity with responsibility. And that's, for me, a stark difference between, say, the ANC and the Democratic Alliance, where I see the ANC perpetuating this welfare system and almost keeping people trapped in a system of welfare without any exit strategies so that people become independent of government. And so there's always this mentality that government must do things for people, whereas the Democratic Alliance says, hey, we want to drop you a lifeline. We want to give you opportunity, but we want you to make use of the opportunity to advance, you know, out of the system of poverty. And those opportunities, place. and will those opportunities be for everyone? Definitely. across the oh. color line, across the class line? So our fourth value is actually diversity. Um, the DA is the only diverse party that has governed in South Africa successfully. Uh, by diversity, I mean all kinds of diversity you can think of from race, from sexual orientation, backgrounds, experience, qualifications. I mean, we are a very diverse group of people. And because of our diversity, we're able to then service everyone. We have no biases or stereotypes towards any constituencies, unlike um, our, in our failed relationship with the EFF, which I alluded to, where they've chosen to align themselves with only a set demographic. The DA has chosen to align themselves with everyone. We believe that we serve everyone and that everyone is important in an ecosystem, such as any level of government. You know, this one is not necessarily directed at you, but to the Democratic Alliance in general. Um, one thing that was trending on Facebook today, I did not really realize until this afternoon when somebody sent me this particular picture. Um, there was a, a massacre in Phoenix, and a lot of people, especially Black Africans, believe that the DA is very insensitive because this is trending. If you go um, after this interview, just go and check on, 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 on social media. These banners are in Phoenix as we speak and they read, the ANC called you racists. The DA calls you heroes. And people, especially black Africans, are believing that this is an insult to black Africans because the DA is gunning for Indian votes at the expense of the lives that were lost um african lives that were lost now you are a mayor you are an african you are standing as a candidate for the da and almost 90 percent of the people that responded to my question they did not say a thing but they just sent me this and they said please ask about this you know what are your yeah it's election time and it's, it's interesting how people can put anything together and make a trend and, you know, and it becomes propaganda and it becomes almost like the truth when it's not. I mean, I remember the time of the Phoenix massacre, the time of the lootings, the protests. John Steenhazen was the only leader that was seen on the ground um, being there, being available, talking to people who were affected and offering a, 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 a helping hand. So for them to turn around today and say that the DA calls people, heroes who, who did wrong, is really unfair. Um, but I'm what? how do you read this, these banners? To you, what is the message? Well, it's the I mean, at face value, what, what, do you, what do you read? I don't know whoever wrote this. I don't know what is the message behind. But for anybody who's looking at it, it's like read between the lines. The ANC called you racist. The DA is calling you heroes. I the perception that is being created here what is your take 
Because so basically people are saying, can you ask her if you are obviously I don't I don't know if you're part of the, the 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 team that is putting up all these messages or even coining these messages, but basically people are saying, please go back and ask your party. Somebody even said to me, I was definitely voting the DA, but after seeing this these these posters, these banners, I said to myself, absolutely not. So, yeah, so I, I mean, I will need a bit of context around this. I doubt that the party is the one that put that together, um, uh, but I would need a bit of context around it. But one thing I can tell you about the Democratic Alliance is that it will never tolerate any wrongdoing. We are the one party in this country that is for the rule of law. We're always for the protection of our constitution and our constitutional democracy. We've demonstrated it over and over and over again. Uh, one thing I can also tell you as a politician, my Myself, is that people paint pictures that they want people to see you know it's happened to me in council I mean I've been labeled all kinds of things that are ludicrous um, I, I, I was accused as, a, as an MMC for instance of demanding limousines and getting picked up from nightclubs I hate clubs you know did you demand example. limousines Never. is that how I, you I mean, guys roll it's ludicrous but I'm just mentioning it to show you that in the political space there are people who will do that. You know, they will paint a picture just to drive a certain perception and drive a certain narrative that's not necessarily even true. But yes, I would need context, but I doubt very highly that that's the DA that put that. It's so easy to grab a DA logo off the internet and do anything with it, really. So I, I really um, hope so, because I must be honest, as a person as well, I was very disturbed when I saw this because I was like, Oops, this is very, it looks very, very insensitive based on what happened in, in, in Phoenix. Now, in the interest of time, you are a mother of three and um, you are a woman, you are a single mother. GPV issues have been um, coming up now and again. A lot has been done, but a lot still needs to be done. What is your take? Because when you talk about Johannesburg as a city, GBV is, is on the high, but also trafficking, human trafficking, pregnant, teenage pregnancies. Um, now, as a woman, what is your message both to females, but also to those who are perpetrators? Ooh, so Nele, you know, you've touched something that's very close to my heart. Um, I think I told you that I, I used to do medical legal work. So I used to see cases of sexual assault cases of domestic violence as a clinician um, and I still go to court today to testify in some of those cases but you know um, one of the things I picked up in the time that I was doing this work is that the real issue here is that women are vulnerable and it's got to do with the socio-economic status of women in this country and the only response, and I know there's the criminal justice system that must come in and so on, but I feel if we can empower women socioeconomically, we would have won half the battle. Because I used to interview my patients and I used to ask them, why do you stay? Is it the first time he's done this to you? Why are you still with him? And over and over, I would get the same response. He takes good care of me. He takes care of me and my children. You know, I don't know where else to go. I've got nowhere to stay. I'm not working. How will I live? And so this poor woman will endure and endure and endure until they die or until somebody gives them a helping hand. And so I, I've really believed ever since that we need to work harder at empowering girls. Um, I'm a corporate coach now. I coach mainly young women uh, because I believe they need it more. I do have a few young men that I also coach, but I'm passionate about developing young women because I believe that when you develop a young woman, you're doing more than just giving them money or a lifeline. You're actually saving their life because they could end up in situations that could uh, um, um, that could kill them. And we see, we've seen that over and over. I don't think enough is being done, but I also don't think that we understand the problem well enough. I don't think that... The, the, the government understands the problem of GBV well enough. Um, some of the women would say, you know, ever since I started working, he started beating me up. He says, now that I have my own money, I've got an opinion, yeah. I've got too much to say. So there's also the element of men not knowing how to deal with an empowered woman. And True. we've done a lot as a nation to punt feminism and, you know, gender equality but what we haven't done is we haven't brought men along as well to prepare them for the transition into a new normal. In our so I guess you will be prioritizing that as well. Oh, definitely. 
definitely. Um, when I was MMC in the city, I championed the establishment of GOD, Gender, Youth and Persons with Disabilities, on the executive side of council, where when we started, it was only that we only had an oversight committee, but we didn't have a GOD focus on the executive side. And I started championing that in my position as MMC for Health and Social Development. It's definitely Good. something that I will be taking forward. Okay. Now, your date of birth, not mentioning the year, Give me the date and the month. 7 November. So I just want to be personal for a moment. You know, uh, when I saw yeah. that, I was like, ah, okay. Um, though we've never really spent time together, but I guess I feel like I know you already. Guess what? Because I was also born on the 7th of November. No so way. I believe I can safely say that you are bold, you are fearless, you are a leader, you are a visionary, you are a go-getter, you get things done, yeah, you know, yeah, you, yeah, you are an yeah. ideas person, but yeah. you, you're, not, you're not afraid of rolling up your sleeves and getting things done, because yeah. when I see you, I guess I see myself. Am I That's right to give you those attributes? Definitely, definitely. I mean, I don't know if you're aware, Helen Suzman was also born on the 7th of November. Oh my goodness, I didn't know. <laughs> but, and I, I didn't know, know that she stood alone in parliament against um, laws that were passed against the majority of people in South Africa, the black people of South Africa, denying them land. And alone, she stood against that government as a woman, a Jewish woman in, in parliament. She was brave. She went to Robben Island. She visited Madiba. She wanted to see how they're being treated in prison. She fought for their rights. She was yeah. involved when the constitution was put together. So yes, I also believe that there's something special about that day that we were Very born. special. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> now, now, as we, we are about to wrap up, two things I want to ask. Small businesses, SMMEs, but also informal traders, will they have a home within the DA-led Johannesburg municipality? Or as the Democratic Alliance, there's something that is a perception that is out there that you only care for white monopoly capital. You only care for big businesses. So SMMEs, informal traders, hawkers, will they have a space within your municipality if you win? Definitely, definitely. I mean, one example, because I don't want to claim, so let's give evidence. When we were in government in Johannesburg, through the Department of Economic Development led by the then MMC Leonard, who's now the DA Caucus leader in Joburg, we rolled out seven opportunity centers. These opportunity centers were one per region, and the idea was that small businesses in those regions should have access to support you know, government support. Um, I know the one in Orange Farm we did in partnership with Discovery, for instance, um, and I was quite involved with MMC not in, in, in rolling out, in particularly launching some of these because of the idea that people should not be trapped in a welfare system. People should be moved into the economic development space where they can be independent, they can be creative, and they can discover their own potential, you know, to, 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 to develop themselves and to make money for themselves and not rely on government. And so we will be continuing with the rollout of such services. I'm not sure if they're still operational now. A lot, a lot has crumbled since we left the city. But over and above that, I mean, today, just as I was walking in the Nord district, uh, a lot of our informal traders were complaining about law enforcement and how they treat it and how their stuff gets confiscated and so on. So uh, the Democratic Alliance wants to have a different approach. First of all, they don't have proper trading spaces. And that's something that we want to, to establish. There are trading spaces in the city, and I've been to various parts of the city in the Rudaport area, even in Ivory Park, where these, these spaces have been left unutilized, they've been vandalized, yet informal traders don't have proper places to trade. So we need to revitalize those spaces, get informal traders into those spaces. We are, of course, aware that they want a lot of food traffic. And so we'll work with them to identify where they need those spaces to be. We need to develop them. They need proper ablution facilities. They can't be using buckets like what we saw today. You know, we will help them get registered as well because the, the huge issue is licensing. And of course, the city has laws, mm -hmm. but how do you reach out to people to enable them to comply? Because a lot of times people don't comply because the environment is difficult, makes it difficult for True. them to comply. So we're going yeah. to be partnering 
rather than, and we tested this in the ECD space, Zanele, when I was MMC, where we partnered with illegal crashers to help them to comply. And we partnered with the private sector where there were resource constraints and we helped people to comply. Good. You know, the, the, there's been a, a number of messages. Unfortunately, I could not be able to read all of them, but I noticed Surya who was saying, 7 November, you go Scorpios. <laughs> and also, um, there are people, yeah, Suraya, uh, Tima Rampeta saying, Scorpios power led woman, by women. Um, there is somebody else who said, um, I am being unfair by asking you about those banners that were put up in, in, in Phoenix. And she is saying, because it is clear that it is not the DA, um, but it must be other opposition parties that have put that up. I do not know. I, I was simply asking because people had asked me to raise that particular issue. I do not know if it, indeed it was the DA or not. I just hope it is not the DA. Um, as to wrap up, you know, we're going to be, why should people vote for you in a nutshell? Why should people vote for you? You know, having said everything that you have been telling us, in a nutshell, if I was to ask you right now, why should somebody who has just switched on and is seeing this particular interview, why should they vote for you? Number one, um, I'm so serious about helping develop the lives of people and i believe you can't build a city if you're not going to build its people i'm so passionate that i put my money where my mouth is and i gave up my comfort i gave up my job my profession i gave up a lot you know and i i, I laid down my life and i'm literally a counselor and i've had to downscale downgrade even my lifestyle my children i've sacrificed the people I love to be able to do this. So that should show you. And I made this decision in 2010, you know, when I closed down the doors of my business. Um, it's not a, a, a random thing that came to me now as a fashionable thing to do. But that's how serious I am. And I'm not a quitter. So I'm not going to quit until it's done. And we're nowhere near the end. So I will continue fighting for the lives of people. I'm pro justice. And I believe in individuals. And that's why I went into coaching. I believe everyone has potential, great potential. And I'm all about supporting people. And in government, you create those supportive environments for people to thrive. And I'm so invested in that. That's the first thing. Secondly, I'm a woman and women are nurturing. The city of Joburg has never had a woman leader. It's never had a woman's touch. And that's why it's all touch and go, touch and go. You know, I really believe that a woman would do wonders in Johannesburg right now, particularly in the broken state that the city is in. I'm emotional. I go out, I see things, I come home, I cry, I pray. I carry the people of Joburg in my heart and in my spirit. So it's not just something that I see as a job, but I see it as a calling and as a mission right now. And Joburg needs that. But also lastly, I mean, I've got qualifications besides medical and I've studied, so I have two diplomas in project management, an advanced diploma, a postgraduate diploma. Um, I've now done corporate coaching. I've done public health adverts. But besides the studies and the experience and that, um, I, I come under a brand that is tried and tested, a brand of good governance, the Democratic Alliance brand, where the DA governs, we govern well. And so I don't come under, because sometimes you can be talented, your heart can be in the right place, but then you're under the wrong um, umbrella and then you fail. But I've chosen to align myself with an organization that is for the people, that has demonstrated that they know how to govern, how to run governments, how to grow economies. The city of Cape Town now has been voted the number one destination for doing business in South Africa, you know. And, and so that's the kind of party that I want to bring, the kind of brand I want to bring to Johannesburg. And I think Joburg had a bit of a taste in 2016 when we governed, even though we didn't have an outright majority and we had to accommodate um, um, certain demands from our partners. But I really want Johannesburg to experience in their lifetime what it's like to have a DA government, the normality, the kind of life that the people in Midvale have, where they never have to worry about basics, where they can dream beyond having water and electricity, maximize their potential and become the best that they can be. Joburg is a land of opportunity. It's the city of gold. Many people come to Joburg in search of opportunity. Unfortunately, the city has disappointed people over 
and over, they find themselves on the streets. I saw them today from Mpumalanga, KZN, and other parts of the country. I believe we can rebuild the city into that city of gold. I believe we can bring back hope, and I believe I'm the right person to do it. And I have experience as an MMC. I know how the city runs. I know what's wrong, what needs to be fixed, and I know exactly how to do it. Well, Dr. Mpo, we wish you all the best. All I can say is that Johannesburg used to be a big kind of light. As you've just said, a lot of people will come, will leave Durban, Limpopo, Mpumalanga, and all the other places, including from other African countries, to come to Johannesburg as the land of fame and fortune um, and the land of dreams, really. Now, we really hope that if you are elected, you will be able to do something that will make us be comfortable again in Johannesburg in terms of crime, in terms of, um, I don't stay in Johannesburg, but I have been looking at what people that stay in Johannesburg are saying. So we really hope that you will have time to come back once you are elected mayor. If people do trust you and give you their vote, you will come back and tell us um, especially in your first 100 days in office. We wish you all the best. And it will be good, by the way, to see a woman leading that that that, that city for a change. But, um, yeah, we, we really hope that the, the, the campaign and what you are promising to people ultimately will be implemented. Because I guess there is this fatigue. People are just tired and that's the message that is coming from literally every corner it doesn't matter what color doesn't matter the class it doesn't matter what religious background people in south africa are at present saying we are tired of promises we are just tired of promises we want service delivery so whether it's going to be the da the anc the udm the eff i don't know who is going to end up ruling and managing johanny the city of johannesburg but if it is you we're hoping that you are going to change the narrative and we're going to see a touch of a woman and we're going to see that bold, that 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 tenacious, um, that, that fearless woman really driving this and making sure that you raise the flag for other ladies that may be following on your footsteps. Thank you so much for joining me and I really appreciated your time. Thanks, Zanelia. I really enjoyed chatting to you. Thanks for the Thank opportunity. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you so Thank much. You. Well, we've come to the end of our program today. I really hope that you have learned a thing or two because it is very critical, it's very important that you know your candidates before you cast your vote. This election is very, very important. It is important to me and I believe it is important to you. By the way, our program is simply called Tell the World and I'm hoping that you are going to subscribe to my YouTube channel, Zanele TV, and follow me on Instagram at Mbogazi Zanele or on Facebook, Zanele Mbogazi. Until next time, we will be coming again with another episode of Tell the World. Cheers for now.